Director Aaron Elkins. Director Kurt. Here. Um, Director McPherson. Here. Director Osborne. Here. Um, Director Smith. Here. And Director Tischler. Yep. Yes, sir, there is a quorum present. Okay, this uh, hearing is to accept public comment and, may, and we may act on uh, to adopt amendments to the district rules regarding water wells within the boundaries of the district, including Ellis, Hill, Johnson, and Somerville County. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to our uh, district's legal counsel um, to make his presentation. Thank you, uh, the last chairman. Kirk and board members, members of the public. Um, some preliminary matters for this thing, jurisdictional matters up front. I'd like to know, uh, we got the recording going? Yes. Uh, yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, please note that this uh, rulemaking hearing is being recorded, and we'll note for the record that notice of this uh, rulemaking hearing was published and posted and provided to all interested persons in accordance with Chapter 36 of the Water Code. Um, we've had these rules um, available at the district office and on our website and anybody that requested them um, at least 20 days prior to this hearing today. And uh, we're going to allow public comment. If anybody desires to uh, provide public comment on the rules uh, verbally, uh, if you'll please sign the registration seat. Uh, registration sheet um, on the little table over here in the corner and we'll recognize you to do so. We've received a couple of written public comments and we'll go through those in a minute. Um, and I'm just going to highlight uh, the, the main changes that are in these rules amendments um, and then go through. We had a rules and bylaws committee meeting this morning um, after everybody uh, had a few weeks to study the proposed rule amendments to see if we had anything else uh, we needed to correct or catch. And lo and behold, there were some things, and I'll go through those as well. Um, but the big thing is, is, is everybody will recall both last November and last December, prior to the board adopting the rules, uh, we noted publicly that uh, we fully expected that we wouldn't have it exactly perfect the first time we did it and that uh, as we went into implement the rules we would um, be tweaking the rules here and there to make improvements or make any necessary corrections that we identified in rules implementation and uh, we've certainly done that earlier in the rule or earlier in the year back in april we had um, suspended imposition of the production limits until the end of the year um, and we and the board had passed an order um, suspending enforcement of production limits in a historic use permit or permit applications and operating permits until January the 1st of 2020. Those changes are reflected in the rules. Um, the board at that time also directed staff uh, back in April to identify any other changes um, working through the summertime that they saw any corrections that needed to be made to the rules so that we could undertake rules amendments all at one time and that's what we're doing here today and so we've worked um, committees met a, a couple of times and we've also had meetings between the district staff and uh, legal counsel to go through the rules as we were as we were designing historic use permit application forms and things like that uh, to to find language in the rules that we, we felt needed to be changed um, to <clears throat> either either for a correction or just because of an improvement of the rules. And so the, the biggest changes today that are in the rules are highlighted in the public notice that was prepared for the rules. And I'm going to go through that and, and make a few comments as well. Um, the first, the big change um, that we, that we, uh, I guess there's, there's a couple of, I consider, b bigger changes in the rules. One of them is the way we, we pay fees, and I'll cover that in, in a bit of detail. The other is the initial <coughs> annual groundwater production allocation under operating permits, which had been set at 25,000 gallons per acre. Um, we're recommending it, increasing that to 50,000 gallons per acre. Um, that's 
um, somewhat to be consistent with other provisions of the rules and somewhat to be a little uh, less onerous on some of our well owners as they go to implement um, rules and, and perhaps seek operating permits to give them a little more water on the front end. Um, as you recall, all of those permits can be cut back and are required to be cut back by the board of the future if we have to do so in order to achieve DFCs, which the, uh, achieve desired future conditions for the aquifer, which are established on a regional basis by Groundwater Management 8, in which the Texas legislature requires us to achieve by law. Um, we can tweak that, that number of gallons per acre back as necessary in the future uh, in order to achieve DFCs. But since that's the case, um, and because we're not, we're not near that border right now, it doesn't appear we wanted to be a little more um, uh, generous on the front end with the per acre allocation and increasing that uh, initial allocation of 50,000 gallons per acre. The other key reason for that is that the predominant uh, well application that we get in this district is for an exempt domestic and livestock well. Um, we get, I don't know how many more of those than every, you know, everything else combined, but we get quite a bit of them. We have a two acre minimum track size. Um, rough estimates of household usage are just over 100,000 gallons per year, which on a two acre domestic uh, well, on our two acre minimum track size would be about 50,000 gallons per acre per well. And so this change, changing for the permitted users over to 50,000 ga gallons per acre, would put them per year, would put them a little more on par with the exempt well owners on how much groundwater is being produced per acre between both the permanent wells and the exempt wells. And so um, that's one of the significant changes. The other, um, I, I think the other big change in here is the way we were to do um, fee payments going forward. It, as, as everybody knows in this room, um, under the temporary rules and under the rules we're currently operating under still, uh, fee payment was based on how much you actually produced. And uh, the, the rules call for a change over that to pay based on the permitted amount instead of the amount actually produced. Um, and, and that wasn't supposed to, to, to switch over until next year. But the way that we had structured it in the rules that were adopted last December by the board, permittees or HUP permit applicants were supposed to pay based on 80% of the permitted amount and then do a true up at the end of the year. Um, they weren't supposed to pump more than 100% of, of the permitted amount, but they could do a true up at the end of the year, after the end of the year, after they got their last reading, and either and, and pay up to <coughs> an additional 20% for how much they pumped up to the 100% of the permitted amount. And the reason for that structure was to encourage folks to conserve water. Um, we wouldn't make you pay for all of your permitted amount if you only pumped 90% of your permitted amount. So uh, giving folks up to a 20% buffer on their permitted amount um, for fee payment. When we looked at the logistics of how we were going to implement that at a staff level and sending out invoices or reminders prior to the beginning of the year and having folks send in payment for 80% of the permitted amount and then looking at doing a true up at the next year at the same time we were trying, you know, the board adopts a fee, fee rate structure prior to the end of the year. We would send out invoices to permittees prior to the end of the year for money they have coming in next year and yet they're still going to a month or two later be, be paying back to the district uh, or uh, a true up amount and all the crisscross signals we just thought you know we might be able to work that out with our with our bigger more sophisticated permit holders um, but trying to deal with that on a small basis people paying 80 percent doing true ups it just looked like it was going to be an implementation nightmare and so instead of doing that, we're still going to allow the 20%, but um, we're paying 100% uh, of the amount on the front end, which can either be through an annual prepayment, um, 
in, in which you can get the the ten percent discount if you prepay the full amount of your permit in uh, in advance for the year prior to the beginning of the year, or payment on a quarterly basis where you prepay the amount for the quarter, one quarter of your permitted amount um, prior to the end of the year, or we still have the monthly uh, fee payment option with a with a, a slight. Uh, let, you know, I won't call it a late payment penalty, but uh, uh, a penalty for um, paying slightly in arrears uh, for those folks that can only do uh, a, a monthly permitted amount. But at the end of the year, for any of those options, the district, it would be the district's um, burden to refund up to 20% of those permit fees back to the permit holder. So we just got, everybody pays up front. Um, whether they're paying, you know, for the whole year at the quarterly basis, the monthly amount, and then the district, after we get the meter readings for the end of the year, um, the district will either refund an amount up to 20% to each permit holder, or at the permit holder's option, we will credit that month that amount to their account, the amount that they're due for a refund. People don't have to apply for a refund um, to get it. Um, we talked about that, but uh, the, the Rules and Bylaws Committee felt that uh, we should put onus on, on the permit holders to have to apply for a refund to get it. The board will just issue that amount, or the district will just issue that amount to the permit holder uh, <coughs> or credit to their account at the end of the year. So the, the same amount of, of, of fees will be paid overall. It's just less transactions between the permit holder and the district to try to eliminate some confusion and bring a little more simplicity to the situation. Um, we also made some changes to the way that contiguous controlled acres are calculated um, under an operating permit uh, in Section 5 of the rules. Um, as you'll recall, the, the rules are structured, whether it's a regular permit holder or a retail public utility that gets some credit for the acreage in their CCN or their political subdivision boundaries, we subtract certain things out from that. One of the things we subtracted out was an estimate of <clears throat> exempt production from an exempt well. Um, we were trying to think of how, how to do that um, from a logistics standpoint and what the committee recommended and, and is in this uh, proposed rule is um, that for any domestic and livestock well, even if they have more than two acres, we just subtract out two acres worth of contiguous controlled acreage from the calculation of how much acreage is el eligible under an operating permit. For them. And so you might have you know 50 acres with a little household well on it. We're not gonna subtract out all 50 acres. We're gonna subtract out two acres uh, for each and every domestic and livestock well that's on property that you would otherwise subtract out from an operating permit. The other key thing that we, we had in there for retail public utilities was um, they subtract out all the operating permits and historic use permits within their CCN when they're getting credit for acreage within their CCN for an operating permit. Uh, one of the, the, the basic changes we made in there besides the one I just said was if they have a historic use permit holder inside their CCN um, rather than just you know adding in that historic use permit holders acreage and then subtracting out their historic use permit we just leave that acreage alone if that permittees um, historic use permit amount is more than the acreage, the, the amount they could pump with their acreage under an operating permit. So if, if I have a CCN for this area right here, and, and we've got a historic use permit holder that has more historic use permit than they have land to give them an equivalent or greater amount under operating permit, we just leave all of that acreage off the table. We don't subtract the historic use permit. We don't add in or subtract out the acreage. We just exclude that acreage from being added into the retail public utilities calculation. Um, we, we can, the, the committee wanted to continue the discount for, for prepayment of water use fees, as I said earlier. Um, 
the district staff will, um, about this time of each year, be sending out to all permit holders um, after the board adopts its water use fee rate for the for the next year, a notice of what that is and what the fees we show due are based on your permitted amount or until historic use permits are issued, um, the amount you've claimed is your maximum historic use in your permit application, which is your permit by rule basically, um, and saying if you'd like to prepay the entire amount, you can get this 10% discount, here's what it is. If you'd like to pay one of the other ways, here's when those are due and here's what the amounts are due. Um, we've delayed all of this new fee structure until January 1 of 2021. We're gonna continue paying um, next year uh, in 2020, just uh, based on the amount that you actually um, pump just like it was under the old rules because the, the general thought was if if the board's not considering these changes until you know today October the 21st and we implement them it's a whole lot to get done in the next two weeks basically to re restructure the entire fee structure for a year so we've continued the old payment system for basically 14 months um, which will also allow the district to get its online database uh, system and its reporting system up to date with these proposed with these we're currently proposed rules changes and, and if the board adopts them will be the, the new rules provisions so that system's flawless and we don't just have a logistics nightmare of trying to implement that um, on very short notice um, we thought that would be a lot easier for our permit holders just to continue to pay for one more year based on on the the way they've been doing it so we can get everything set up just right and do it in a way that that'll cause the least disruption to everybody um, we have a new reporting structure um, everybody uh, in the committee felt pretty strongly about this uh, everybody's already required to do monthly meter readings most of our permittees, I think, are already on a monthly reporting system, um, and the committee just wants everybody to get uh, on with monthly reporting since they have to do monthly reader, meter readings anyway, uh, and just have a regular monthly reporting process to the district, which will also engender better management of the groundwater resource and allow us to keep track of how much is being pumped on a monthly basis throughout the year. Um, we added um, oh, we eliminated the requirement for well completion report deposits by well drillers. Um, as you'll recall right now, when a well driller wants to drill a well, they have to send in a deposit to the district. After they drill that well and they turn in um, their state well report to the district, we give them a deposit back. Um, staff felt that that's an unnecessary burden for both the well drillers and the district just to get that deposit in and give it back. If our well drillers aren't turning in their well reports um, like they should be, they feel there's sufficient enforcement mechanisms between the district's rules and the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation to ensure that the well drillers will get those reports in on time without having to swap a deposit <coughs> back and forth, save some time on accounting. And so that process has been eliminated. We added a petition process for additional production authorization, um, basically that says if, if any, you know, if any well owner or landowner feels that the application of these rules uh, to them uh, violate their their constitutional right to a quote you know, fair share of the groundwater, as the Supreme Court says in the Day opinion, uh, and they feel like the rules result in the taking of their property that before they just go and sue uh, sue the district and district court that they can petition this board so this board can have an opportunity to consider that evidence and consider granting them additional production authority if we think that the rules have because of the particular facts involved worked against a landowner in a way that they're not getting their fair share of groundwater uh, within that meaning of the under the Supreme Court's opinion and so we, we include that in there and and just trying to reduce lawsuits and give this board an opportunity to consider everybody's grievances uh, before we go off into the court system. 
Um, we put some extra language in the historic use uh, permitting process just on what type of evidence uh, the district would consider. Um, uh, this is especially to do with those, those uh, wells that are eligible for historic use permits but weren't pumping because they got approved before our, the, the well registration got approved before the district adopted the rules last December. Uh, but those wells weren't in the ground yet during the historic use period. And we have the provision that says, you know, you can get a historic use permit amount up to the maximum plan uh, production capacity that you have for that well. We have some pr provisions in the evidence provision that says, We'd like to see permit applicants come up with planning or design documents. You know, if you say that you were planning for this new well to serve a 300 unit subdivision, well, certainly you have, you have some information uh, that showed that you were going to have a, you know, a preliminary plat or something that showed you planned to have a 300 unit subdivision out there. We want to see that type of evidence um, in the historic use permit process. Those are the, the big changes that we, that we had in in, in the proposed rules. Um, we received a couple of written comments and um, one from uh, Mr. Benson who's here today and one from uh, Christopher Smith of Smith Gentleman um, who either through one of the greatest coincidences in the history of Earth uh, or they actually communicated prior to submitting their comments. They have uh, a, a similar suggestion, which is um, an identical suggestion, which says that uh, they'd like to see some language that says in reviewing historic use permit applications, the district may consider all relevant information regarding maximum historic use of individual wells and well systems. Um, we considered that comment in the Rules and Bylaws Committee meeting this morning, and do recommend including that language, but not at the place that they had suggested we put it in in, uh, in Rule 11.3. Um, we but we do have a couple of places, and I'm going to note that when I go through the rules um, on some additional language changes we'd like to recommend um, in addition to what we we've, we've already got in the published rules. Um, Before I go through anything else, is there any, any any board member that has any questions on any of the proposed language um, that we could answer at this time? Uh, I do have a couple of questions, but not related to the language. Okay. Uh, the comments. <clears throat> That were turned into us, the ones you just referenced. Yes, sir. Does that go back to the committee for consideration before we vote vote on it? Um, it doesn't have to. The committee met this. Both, both, one of those came in, I guess, yesterday, and one of them Friday, and we we considered them this morning, and we we made some recommended changes that I'm fixing to go over for the board's consideration. Okay. And then the second question I have is from uh, <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, Help me understand the Chaparral Steel versus Grinnell. Why is it say in this letter from Smith and Dolan, uh, Chaparral Steel instead of Grinnell? Uh, I don't represent them. I think that's just the way they call it, what they call themselves. Yeah. You, you haven't had any communications with them in regard to? You might can answer that. I think Chaparral Steel, Midlothian LP is a wholly owned subsidiary of Gerdau now, but I'm not sure. But that's that's yeah, Dale just, that's just Dale Harmon's outfit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I was just curious why. I, I mean. Yeah, I have to go back to a little cheat sheet I was given when I first got hired of who's who because it, it's changed. Now, well, I think I think when Gerdau and Maris Steel bought um, Chaparral, I think they left the company intact as a wholly owned subsidiary okay. of Gerdau and Maristil. But I, I know that from, a, from an air permitting issue a long time ago, not from part of this process. So the well that they have 
and that we've discussed before probably is under Chaparral rather than Verdal, is that what you're saying? I think so. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay, I'm going to march through the rules. I've tabbed the pages that we have uh, during the three weeks since we published, gone through page by page to make sure all the changes are consistent and um, consistent with not only the, the rules and bylaws committee discussion, but this board's, um, we, we, we met on these rules to go through some of the proposals um, last month and had the discussion on those in executive session about uh, some of the legal implications of those rules and we inadvertently left off at least one key thing and that was a delay of the enforcement of the pumping limits um, until next calendar year um, we passed that we passed that board resolution in April um, we said we were going to do that, but that didn't get into the draft rules, and so there's two, 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 two different places where we make a change from 2019 to 2020, um, and then there's some other smaller changes, but I'm going to go through and highlight those, um, but just be advised that the changes I'm reading into the record are the changes we're recommending for your approval. Um, one of them is on page 15, um, under the definition of historic use permit. Um, means a, a permit required by the district for the operation of any non-exempt existing water well or well system to produce groundwater during the existing and historic use period, adding the words, or any other well that's otherwise authorized to obtain a historic use permit under Rule 3.8, because we have those wells that were approved prior to December, but didn't pump water during the existing historic period that we have said in Rule 3.8 are eligible for such permits. Uh, they're already authorized under 3.8. We, we felt a definition of change was appropriate to cross-reference that change that's in 3.8. Um, on page 34, rule 3.6, subdivision 10, um, this is uh, in response to the comments we received from TXI and Chaparral. Um, this is what the board, this section is before granting or denying the permit, the board shall consider, subdivision 10 says, for historic use permit applications, the maximum historic use for each well in the application and if applicable for the well system. We, pro we propose changing that to for historic use permit applications all relevant information regarding the maximum historic use for each well in the application and if applicable for the well system. Um, Chaparral and TXI's op, uh, suggestion added this consideration of all relevant information by the district. <clears throat> we split that up into the board and the general manager. Uh, this is the one for the board to consider all relevant information. I think that's implied anyway. I don't think it's a substantive change, but. Um, evidently, uh, it could be clearer or we wouldn't have received the comment. Um, on the next page, 36, in provision 3.8F, as a break, during the time between January 1, that should be 2020 instead of 2019, um, since we've delayed imposition of the and enforcement of the production limits until uh, next calendar year, and at the end of that sentence, and shall pay the water use fees, it presently says as set forth in Rule 7.1 for the amount of groundwater specified in the applicant's application. We want to change that to and shall pay the water use fees as required in Section 7 of these rules. The reason for that change is because we're going to continue payment of the water use fees based on the amount pumped for next calendar year. And then it'll change over to the amount um, based on the permitted amount in 2021 and beyond. The next change is 
on page 64, rule 5.1. Under subsection A, um, change the date from January 1, 2019 to January 1, 2020. Everywhere in that rule, in fact, where it says 2019, we're going to change it to 2020 because we've delayed imposition of enforcement of that. Uh, and, and, and where it says after January 1, 2019, we're just going to change that to beginning January 1 of 2020. We say after, I guess that implies that it doesn't start until January the 2nd, which is not what was intended. So beginning January 1, 2020, all through that rule. <clears throat> and then um, we're adding a new subsection D, which is a temporary provision uh, just to account for what do you pump between now and 2020 when the uh, January 1, 2020, when that new rule goes into effect, we're adding a temporary provision, which reads, and I quote, temporary provision, groundwater produced prior to January 1, 2020 shall be subject to the produ production limitations set forth in Section 5 of the District's temporary rules for water wells, and the rules set forth in that Section 5 and all enforcement provisions related to those rules are continued in effect for that purpose until January 1, 2020. This subsection expires April 1, 2020, except that it remains in effect for purposes of enforcement of any violations of this subsection that occur prior to that day. Again, we're, we're, we're saying we're not imposing those rules until 20, <clears throat> until 2020. So what are the production limits in effect between now and that day? The ones that are still on the old temporary rules. And all, the, all that said was you can pump as much as you send in timely water you be payments. That's the only limit on how much you can pump. So, um, it was important for legal purposes to continue that provision in effect so that it remains in effect for purposes of how much folks can pump between now and then. Um, on page 66, rule 5.3A Two. Um, this has to do with the topic of um, how we subtract out exempt production that I mentioned earlier in my introduction uh, from an operating permit. The language presently says um, that we subtract out two for any property with an exempt well under Rule 2.1, the lesser of the actual size of the tract where the well is located or two acres per exempt well. The question became, what about all the exempt wells that we don't know about? How are we supposed to subtract out two acres for those? Because, as you know, we didn't have a requirement that all the little exempt domestic and livestock wells that existed prior to our first rules, we did not require them to come register with the district. We made that voluntary. And so we borrowed some language from the, from the well spacing rules. Um, to say that that only applies to registered exempt wells or uh, exempt wells otherwise known by the district to exist. And so that the language would now read, for any property with an exempt well under Rule 2.1 that is registered with the district or otherwise known by the district to exist, comma, the lesser of the actual size of the tract where the well is located for two acres per exempt. And skipping over to section 7, on page 75, <coughs> um, in the second sentence of water use phase, it says the rate shall be applied to the groundwater pumpage in the ensuing calendar year. We would change that to read, the rate shall be applied to the groundwater pumpage authorized to be produced in the ensuing calendar year, which will take account for either one, uh, next year where they're still paying based on the pump, the actual amount pumped, or any year thereafter, which is based on the permitted amount. So the rate shall be applied to the groundwater pumpage authorized to be produced. And authorized to be produced is covered by other sections on whether it's 
prior to 2021 or after. Skipping way back over to page 116, rule 11.3a. This is another change in response to the Chaparral TXI comment. This is on the general manager side. We already covered the board side. This is in the general manager's technical review of a historic use permit application. Um, the second sentence there says the general manager may request additional information from the applicant to support the general manager's technical review and development of a recommendation. We add the words, and may consider all relevant information regarding maximum historic use of individual wells and well systems, which is the language suggested in the comment. So we'll have the general manager considering that in development of the general manager's recommendation for the board on each historic use permit application and then back in 3.6 that we already covered we'll have the board considering all relevant information when it acts to grant or deny that permit. Um, on page 117d uh, I just note that we have those uh, the nomenclature for the formatting says D A and DB changing those to D1 and D2 just to be consistent with our other formatting. Um, and the final change we have is on page 119 in the preliminary hearing section on 11.6. Um, the last two sentences on A and B, we just have some incorrect rule number references in there. Um, that second to the last sentence on A, for any application determined to be uncontested, the uncontested hearing procedures of section 10 of these rules shall apply. We'll delete the words as set forth in rules 10.2 and 10.5. <clears throat> Just any uncontested hearing procedure in section 10 shall apply. And the discretion of the hearing body, the procedures of rule, that should be 10.13, not 10.10, .10, may also be applicable. Um, and then in B, uh, on the second line of 11.6b, delete the words as set forth at rule 10.2 and rule 10.6. <clears throat> so that it reads, contested applications for any application determined to be contested, the contested hearings procedures of section 10 of these rules shall apply to historic use permit applications. And if we, we change those rules number, those, those rule numbers were updated previously and didn't get corrected, but there's actually no need for them. Any, any contested procedures in section 10 would apply. Um, and that is it on the recommended changes to the rule. Um, I would be happy to answer um, any questions. Did we have anybody that signed up and wanted to make verbal comments? We did. If you'll get the sign in sheet. <coughs> <laughs> okay, Brady Ostrander, Buena Vista, Bethel. Oh, that I didn't. I didn't know what that was for. We signed in. We're on the. We're on the agenda. <laughs> oh, yeah. We just. Does, any, does anybody want to speak on these rules changes? Is there anybody here? I just. I, just, I didn't want to add. Buck uh, Benson, for the record. Thank you. I just did want to add that we, you know, we think the monthly reporting is uh, not necessarily needed, and we would, but we would support quarterly reporting for us. So I want to add that comment. Thank you. And I did and I did submit your email as written comments regarding the same. Thank you. And, and the committee uh, reviewed that just for the board's information and, and the thought was um, it's, a, it's a little more onerous but uh, to some folks that weren't doing monthly reporting already as I said earlier, the vast majority of our our, our non-exempt well owners are doing monthly reporting, but the rules require monthly meter readings anyway, and uh, for all the reasons I said earlier, the committee's recommendation to go forward with everybody doing monthly meter reading reporting to the district. Um, 
I'd be happy to answer any questions to the board or if the board um, seeks some legal advice on any of these uh, provisions, I'd be happy to uh, go into executive session to talk about the legal implications of any of these if any board member feels it's necessary. entertain a motion. Uh, deem it appropriate that the board entertain a motion uh, approving or adopting resolution 1911 uh, to adopt these rules amendments. As, as published with <coughs> the modifications that I just read into the record. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, no, no further discussion. Uh, if any of the discussion is, is desired, then we can go into executive session. If not, we can go ahead and vote on this thing. Yes, sir. All right. All those in favor? Uh, uh, all opposed? Motion passes. Okay. Could I ask? I didn't see. I don't think Sinclair did. Who made the motion? Paul. Paul. And second? Kim. Thank you. And that will end our audio recording of this hearing. <laughs>